So, good afternoon. I will introduce my topic, which is connected with fund management and uh, regional biodiversity decline. So, uh, I'm Philip Harvish from the Faculty of Environmental Sciences, and I'm primary odontologist. So, I'm interested in dragonflies and damselflies, and my uh, topics are connected with freshwater ecosystems. In the, my previous studies, I spent a lot of time with uh, specific topics. Usually, I spend many, uh, many years with threatened species, uh, especially dragonfly species, which are uh, highly influenced by the human activities. And I also spend a lot of time in post mining areas because there are a lot of diversity uh, in dragonfly and damselflies, and also there are species which are uh, extinct in uh, recent habitats, especially in habitats which are uh, which are degraded in the common landscape. I also participated in uh, several books. And my favorite one is the uh, Dragonflies and Damselflies of Czech Republic, which was uh, made uh, three years ago. And I also collaborated with my colleagues on the regular of red list, Czech red list of Dragonflies. So I'm primary odontologist, but in my future studies, I will introduce the problem of Fond uh, diversity. So the problem is very complex, and uh, the knowledge about dragonflies and damselflies is not enough to understand all the <coughs> complex and the, all the problems which are connected with fond diversity. So I spend a lot of time uh, with different groups of freshwater uh, organisms, and also uh, I uh, have uh, my colleagues with work with amphibians, so we try to understand more complex the problem of freshwater diversity. Uh, I will start my presentation with the definition, what is the point? Basic problem, uh, because there are a lot of uh, definitions and many definitions are very broad, so I will start with uh, very broad definitions, which uh, describe uh, the bond as an ecosystem, which is the, some hole in, in the, some hole which is filled by water, and this hole is natural or artificial. So th there are most differences between uh, natural ponds and artificial. Uh, usually, uh, many authors describe ponds as something which is smaller than lake. Uh, there is no definition about what is the pond in the system of food plant. So uh, ponds usually are part of the river system, or they are also can be somehow isolated depressions anywhere. So they could not be should not be uh, as a part of some food plant, food plant system. So ponds are uh, very broadly definite. Uh, I found also the definitions which are more complex and describe the pond as something which is uh, more actual and something which can be used for the conservation. For example, one definition uh, provides uh, the information that a pond is some, some <coughs> water body where light penetrates to the bottom of the water body. So light is penetrating through the water column into the bottom. Another definition describes <coughs> water as something uh, that is shallow enough, some water ecosystem which is shallow enough, uh, that ro roots of the plants are able to grow through the water bottom to, and they are able to grow in this ecosystem. There is also some limitation in the size Usually, Ramsay Wetland Convention uh, described or set the upper limit of ponds, and this upper limit is about 
eight hectares, but usually we describe ones as some uh, water body which is upper limit about five hectares. This is some definition from ground side of my foundation. Uh, <coughs> usually in Central Europe, we describe bond as uh, something which is usually uh, constructed for some purpose. So usually ponds are uh, human-made habitats which are uh, created for some reasons. Usually it is about fish farming activities, for water storage or for recreation. So it is a human-created uh, habitat. But also other organisms are able to create ponds. So not only humans are uh, those who are able to create such habitat. For example, beavers are able to create specific type of ponds, and these ponds uh, has high diversity. There are several studies from different continents where it was described that beaver ponds has higher uh, density of, uh, or higher abundance and higher diversity of species than natural wetlands. Also, the uniqueness of species which are uh, which were found in these specific ponds can be much higher or significantly higher than in the natural wetlands. For example, uh, there were some groups in, in the study of law. Uh, there were two basic groups of organisms. There were specified aquatic plants and also diving beetles as a indicator groups. Both groups were more abundant in, abundant in beaver ponds. So, also beavers can create specific type of ponds. Uh, as I told you at the beginning, uh, ponds are ecosystem which is connected with uh, freshwater insects also. So. Uh, my special editions are dragonflies, so there are several studies which I uh, pointed as the main reason why you know, <coughs> we can uh, compare the diversity of different freshwater habitats. And according to dragonflies and damselflies, ponds are, are maybe the most interesting habitat for the highest diversity. So there is the highest diversity of Dragonflies and dendroflies in ponds, according to lakes, ditches, rivers, or streams. Rivers and streams usually uh, has lower amount of species. There are some uh, natural differences, especially wind overwintering uh, possibilities in flowing waters is much, uh, much dangerous habitat for overwintering than. Uh, typically standing waters, but also ponds are much more uh, diverse than natural lakes, which is interesting. Uh, many authors, for example, the, the Mister, uh, highlighted freshwater ponds as one of the habitat which is overseen uh, by many conservation organizations, but uh, there are some highlights that uh, ponds can be seen as one specific study system for conservation of different groups of organisms. So there is no only one group which can be uh, studied and that could be protected through the system of uh, ponds, but uh, ponds can be seen much more important in the regional, regional and also in some uh, some uh, local scale, so we can find specific ponds which can be used for the conservation of many uh, threatened species. Uh, in recent several regions, for example in Central Europe, uh, ponds are very abundant, so they are also the dominating ha freshwater habitats in the landscape, so we cannot ignore the most uh, abundant habitat which is maybe more common than the natural alternatives. Usually in the Czech Republic there is a high density of ponds 
in several regions, so we can find several thousands of, of bones in this small state. Uh, there are also <coughs> variety of wide variety of bones because uh, there are different types. Uh, they, they have different origin, they have also uh, different structure, and they have also different diversity. So uh, the wide variety of bones is very important because if we uh, created bones for one reason, we are not able to uh, protect so much wide spectrum of species. But we have, if we have only one type, uh, there is only a limited number of species. And if we provide protection for the wider variety of bones, we can uh, protect much more species in, in this uh, specific conservation. Uh, usually, as I, I will mention in the next slides, uh, bones are often uh, threatened by different habitat destruction because uh, bones are very small according to uh, larger uh, structural units and these bones can be also seen as the quality indicators. If you measure some specific indicators in the bones, you can also select or you can indicate the state of the landscape, for example. So uh, bones can be seen as some indicator of quality. Uh, also, bones and tools are uh, somehow <coughs> highly connected with landscape. Usually, some ecologists uh, see uh, uh, bones as aquatic islands in the sea, which are terrestrial habitats. So, this imagination that bones can be seen as something like islands uh, in the terrestrial habitats. So, islands differently, can be seen differently in comparison to, for example, seas, so islands of the freshwater habitats. Uh, because they have small size, uh, usually bones can be easy to sample. So there are a lot of studies because if you sample, uh, for example, large areas, uh, you, are, you are not able to sample representative unit for all organisms. So bones uh, are relatively small and you are able to provide uh, relevant information about their diversity. So it can be very useful for future conservation. Um, there are also complex ecosystems which are close to natural or natural ecosystems, but these uh, ecosystems are relatively simple. This means that this, uh, studying these um, ecosystems can be also useful uh, to understand how it is working also in larger natural plants, <coughs> for example. So these ecosystems are very, uh, very complex, but <coughs> not so complex uh, for, for, for studying the relationship between, for example, the species which are included. Uh, usually the diversity of bones is influenced by both abiotic and also biotic factors. From the abiotic factors, we have to mention area of the, of the bond. We can also measure the depth of the bond because uh, there can be some variation. For example, the origin of bones is very uh, important to uh, understand the diversity because they have different depths and different area. Uh, for example, in Mediterranean areas, we have also uh, ponds which are, have no permanent uh, water level. This, this is important because this type of ponds uh, are uh, some objects of conservation studies, but uh, these ponds have very specific uh, diversity, very specific uh, groups of organisms which are connected with this habitat. In Central Europe, we have usually permanent uh, bones. Uh, the permanency means that for several years, for example, there is a still uh, water level which is not so, uh, in, in, which is not uh, changing through the years. So we usually expected that 
that ones are stable. Uh, abiotic factors which are highly influencing the diversity of ponds are also nutrition. Usually there are some nutrients which can highly influence the diversity negatively and also positively. It depends on how much there is uh, the amount of nutrients and how uh, they are uh, distributed in, in the system of the pond. There are also some uh, abiotic factors for example, shading of the watershed, uh, which can also influence the diversity. I will give, give one nice example uh, from dragonflies. Uh, there are also factors which can be influenced by the human activities. For example, pH or salinity of the plant can be also highly influenced, influencing the diversity. And also, the presence or absence of inlet and outlets can have some influence on, on, the, on the diversity. So all these um, factors can have an influence. Uh, this is the typical study from Beat Erkley from Switzerland uh, who provides some information that there are several groups of organisms, for example dragonflies, gastropods or some uh, aquatic plants, which are highly influenced by the size of the ponds. And if uh, there is increasing area of the pond, these groups are also, the diversity is highly increasing. But there are groups which are not influenced by the size. For example, uh, there are diving beetles, or generally colopterans, are not influenced by the size. And we have a lot of species which are usually which are usually found in the smaller habitats, but we have also species which prefer the larger ponds. So there is no difference in the general diversity, I mean uh, number of species. Uh, here's the information about the influence of shading. Especially for several insect orders, Shading seems to be a very important uh, factor. Uh, there, are, there is something which is, uh, ha which is hard to understand, but uh, if this pond is completely open habitat, the diversity of insects, of dragonflies in this example, can be very small because there are no, uh, there are no shelters for for these individuals, and they cannot be protected against environmental uh, influences about predators. So the uh, defi uh, deficit of uh, sheltering possibilities is highly negative. But if the shading is high, the level of shading is high, then also the diversity is very low because these habitats are usually uh, there is not enough. Uh, temperature resources which can influence positively the activity of these insects, especially adults, are not able to uh, move or see the predators or something. So, uh, several studies found that uh, the amount of shading can highly influence the presence and abundance of many, many uh, insect orders. Uh, there are several studies that uh, highlighting the recent effect of uh, nutrition which are uh, added, which were added uh, to the uh, bonds. Because in the last centuries, uh, bonds were seen as the natural ecosystem and the amount of fish in this ecosystem was much lower because uh, there, this amount was influenced by the amount of uh, resources which are in the, in the pond, which this pond can create through the year. This, is, this, high, this amount highly influenced the amount of fishes which were able to survive in these conditions. But uh, during the intensification of fish farming activities, uh, people realized that ponds can produce much more uh, fish 
and therefore, therefore they add uh, nutrition inside the bones, especially uh, they produce some nitrogen and also they increase the amount of uh, phosphorus and both uh, both uh, additions were seen as positive in the uh, several years, but after several decades it indicated uh, high di diversity uh, decrease because these influences uh, have some negative effect on everything, on, on the vegetation, on, on the systems of, uh, of oxygen uh, availability and other uh, aspects. So this is a very complex problem and there was no such a problem at the beginning when uh, the people started to uh, add this nutrition inside these ecosystems. But after several decades, these problems uh, can be very intensive and there are, no so, so there are not uh, so, many, uh, uh, so many possibilities how we can improve the state of these ponds. Biotic factors can be seen also as a very important factors. For example, macrophytes uh, can influence the diversity at all. Uh, macrophytes, I mean littoral and also submerged vegetation, which also provide some short-term possibilities for freshwater uh, and animals. But also such uh, macrophytes can influence the inlet of nutrition and this can also influence some uh, other possibilities for, for example, freshwater insects. Uh, usually, as a main factor which influences the diversity of, of ponds, we can see fish stock. Usually, the amount of fish in the, in the pond can highly influence the, uh, the amount of other groups, especially uh, freshwater invertebrates and but also amphibians, for example. But this is not completely about the amount of fish, but also some uh, composition, about the, some composition uh, and uh, how many of predators, how many of uh, grazing fishes can be in the pond. So there is no uh, equation how much this pond can, uh, can have, uh, how much amount of fish can uh, survive for a long time in the pond. In the pond. So, uh, also, uh, wild folks has negative effect, usually when there are uh, high densities, then they can have uh, several different effects on, on the diversity of freshwater uh, invertebrates. Not only predation, but also some uh, indirect effects uh, which can influence the diversity. Uh, there are also nice studies that highlighting the effect of grazing animals uh, for example, cattle, which can also highly influence the diversity of ponds. I will give one nice example from Canada, so this can be also influencing. And recently, uh, it also in fish ponds, we are speaking about invasive species. We have many invasive species which can influence also the diversity of ponds. Uh, there are several invasive species. Recently, also in Central Europe, we have uh, probably a very important negative factor, which is not influencing diversity uh, in Czech Republic, but it started to influence diversity in Germany, and there are some problems with diversity in different states, for example, in Italy, and previously there were also some uh, invasive species in uh, Japan, for example. Uh, I mean uh, the invasion of crayfish. Crayfish seems to be uh, not so dangerous animal, but it was found that, that crayfish can highly influence the diversity of many different taxa. Uh, crayfish are highly influencing the diversity of ponds because they are destroying 
uh, all types of vegetation. <coughs> After they eat all the vegetation, they can also uh, eat everything. So they are uh, influencing the freshwater invertebrates, fishes, and after the inversion of, of crayfish in the ponds, usually the result is the complete uh, dead water without uh, diversity. There are only several fish species which are able to survive this inversion, but very low diversity of fish can survive this attack. Uh, it is uh, usually people uh, they, uh, think that uh, crayfish are not mobile, so they are not dangerous for, uh, for example, ponds, because ponds are uh, usually isolated, but, for example, in Germany, it was found that many crayfish are able to migrate for, for uh, some resources for several kilometers, so they are able to abandon the pond, and they are able to find another ponds in the surrounding area. And for example, this picture uh, is the crayfish in the Berlin, in the, in the park in the center of Berlin, where this crayfish is trying to find another habitat. But we have also another invasive species, which can be also highly influencing the diversity. Uh, this is the study of food and dry salmon, uh, which, is, which is relatively old, but this uh, study highlighting the effect of cattle grazing on the diversity of uh, dragonflies and damselflies. This study found that there is an indirect effect on the diversity because cattle is not influencing directly uh, the dragonflies and damselflies. But this cattle is influencing the height of the vegetation. And several species of dragonflies and damselflies are influenced by this height because they are preferring the habitats with the high height of uh, vegetation, for example, Circus acutus, as the height upper uh, 70 centimeters. And if this uh, grazing effect is decreasing the uh, height of vegetation, uh, these communities of freshwater insects are usually negatively influenced. So also this grazing can be negative. So this is not only about one species of, uh, of uh, lateral vegetation, but there are several species which are also negatively influenced by grazing. And especially in, in uh, this uh, freshwater ponds, diversity is highly negated by uh, fish predation. Usually, uh, this effect is not uh, the same for all the groups which are uh, inside the pond. There are several groups which are not negatively affected by fish predators. For example, uh, mayflies are not highly influenced because they have some specific behavioral strategies how do they avoid the fish predators? But for example, diving beetles, uh, these diving beetles are able to detect the fish inside the pond, and these diving beetles are able to uh, leave these habitats before they oviposit uh, their eggs into the water. So they're avoiding the habitats with high fish stock. But this is not. Uh, Difficult for all groups. The question is how these uh, groups, for example, freshwater uh, insects, how they can uh, detect the fish predator in the water. Uh, they have some specific defenses. Uh, several defenses is based on the detection. Several de uh, de uh, defenses is based on the uh, specific strategies how they can avoid the predation if they are inside the water and they cannot escape. Uh, there is importance of top predator. So if uh, the top predator is fish, usually there are some uh, mixture of behavior or morphological defense. But uh, we can also <coughs> have some groups which are able to avoid this 
uh, bones before they move inside the water. This is important and maybe one of the most important adaptation against the fish predation is chiromon detection. Chiromons are substances which are uh, which are detected by the prey and the producer is the fish. So the producer is the fish, the fish somehow produce some substances unintentionally, so there is no uh, producing producing of uh, these substances, uh, they don't want it, so they uh, produce such substances. Uh, usually during predation, they eat some prey, and these particles of prey can be spread in the water, and these particles can be detected as some indication of presence of this predator. So these are chironomes. And we have several nice studies indicating uh, how uh, freshwater invertebrates are able to avoid fish. Uh, there are several diving beetles <coughs> which were found that are able to detect this uh, fish predators inside the pond. Usually uh, they use these carbons as the main indicator of the presence of fish but also uh, some structural vegetation. So if the, there is something missing in the pond, uh, these diving beetles are not ovipositing and they are also not present in this habitat. So they are avoiding these habitats at all. But if we uh, see another groups of insects, for example, they are blind for this, for this negative effect. They are not able to detect this fish predators and they usually oviposit in these habitats. And what is interesting, uh, my colleague uh, from the University of Ostrava provides some uh, interesting result. Uh, she compared uh, the pres or the oviposition and the emergence of two species which are uh, which, are complete, which have completely different strategy. Sympatrum depressius plume is habitat specialist. And this species uh, should avoid this habitat, but it, this species is not able to detect this fish in, in this habitat. And after the oviposition, usually the individuals oviposited in all available ponds, but only one population in one pond survived this. Uh, Sympatrum sanguineum is a generalist and also the species oviposited in all available ponds. But this species was able to survive in uh, two ponds, so there is no much difference. This means, this study indicates, that uh, several groups, for example dragonflies, are not able to detect fish and their uh, offspring is somehow uh, uh, is not able to survive because their parents uh, decided wrong uh, habitat for their development. So it's very dangerous for many. Uh, if this uh, larvae or this egg is inside the water, there is no possibility for our, uh, individuals how to avoid the predators because there is no possibility of escape. They have only, uh, they can only fight against the predators, and maybe the most uh, important possibility is how they can protect themselves against predators are morphological defense, so some part of thorns, for example, on the body, or second protection is uh, behavior activity. It was found that several species of flies, for example, are completely different, like behaving if there is the predator uh, dragonfly nymph, and if they change the predator, the change will be one, type, one species of fish, this fish predator uh, can also attack this uh, can also detect these uh, uh, names, and if they change the predator, the behavior 
of, of the uh, larvae was completely different. So if they are very passive, they can change to high activity. So it is very interesting because behavior defense can be also uh, very important how to survive the fish predation. But it was found that uh, species which has uh, effective protection with morphological defense are not avoiding the top predators as the dragonfly nymphs. And if there are predators which are able to survive with dragonfly nymphs, they are not able to survive with fish. So it is a very uh, specific trait of strategy in behavior. Now we will skip the topic and we will go to uh, diversity decline because the diversity decline uh, is a very huge problem. Uh, usually there are some numbers which are highlighting the problems of diversity decline and recently in freshwater ecosystems the, this decline is very very high and it, was, it is somehow calculated that there is a loss of diversity about 4% of species per decade. So per decade we lost generally 4% of freshwater diversity. Every decade 4%. So this is much faster than in terrestrial habitats, for example. And another number, a uh, very uh, new study uh, found that freshwater megafauna declined about 88% since 1970. So from a very uh, short time, we have lost about 88% of all species of diversity, or not all species, uh, abundance. Of, it is based on abundance, so we lost 88% of individuals. Global uh, freshwater diversity decline is a large problem because we usually not using only several species, but we are using we are losing uh, some functional groups. It means that we are losing some parts of uh, food webs, for example, and this part of food webs cannot be uh, somehow substituted. So we are losing high diversity of of this. Uh, connections, and if we lose these connections, we are not able to, uh, to look forward how it will look in the next few years. So we are losing, uh, losing the whole system, not only one part, but we can also, pro this can also mean some destruction of the system. Uh, usually, when we are speaking about the diversity decline, previously we are speaking about the extinction of several species. But recently it was found that the freshwater diversity and general diversity is declining also the abundance of common species. Which is like this is very large a problem because if we are losing common species, usually common species are creating such uh, ecosystem services. And these ecosystem services are uh, essential for functioning how whole diversity. So this is very important to understand all these problems. Because I am entomologist, I am, I am uh, interested in, in uh, dragonflies and damselflies and other insects. Uh, uh, I, am, uh, I give you some information about uh, the problems of insect diversity which are highly uh, problematic and recently we are speaking about about high insect diversity crisis. Uh, previously people thought that insects are everywhere and it is not possible to uh, harm these insects so much that there will be large extinction. But if we remember maybe uh, if we look several decades ago, so into, into the history, uh, there was one nice example. Most abundant bird species on our planet, now historically, uh, most abundant species on our planet was also extinct, and this species was highly abundant. People were killing 
thousands of these birds as a entertainment of, of, uh, of some hunters, they also killed thousands of these uh, individuals. And they, people thought that this is impossible to uh, kill all these uh, pigeons. But for several decades, it was impossible. But after, they were able to uh, kill these animals, especially because they dis destroyed all their suitable habitats for the species. So the prediction of, for insects can be also very dangerous. Uh, several authors speaking about insect apocalypse, because we have uh, several groups of insects which are highly decreasing, especially their abundances in ecosystems. <coughs> it is not known, but caddyflies, typical freshwater insects, are the highly influenced groups of, uh, of uh, all invertebrates, which is highly influenced by human activities. We have also another groups like mayflies or dragonflies, which are also highly influenced. Uh, there's one controversial study from Germany which provides information from national reserves. Uh, and this study provides this information that about 75% of biomass was lost during the last 27 years. Uh, there are some uh, doubts about the methodological, methodological structure of the study. But uh, these numbers are highlighting the problem. So maybe, possibly, it is not so strange problem with about 75% can be uh, somehow different, but there is a large decline. This is, there is no doubt at all. Uh, there is also another conservation study based on uh, similar expectations and similar methodological support. Uh, and this study also provides the uh, effect of individual human activities on the insects and on, on uh, their loss. And it was found that uh, also the, the freshwater insect groups are maybe the most affected groups. So uh, insect groups are highly influenced and uh, about <coughs> more than uh, more than 40 percent of species are in decline. So it means that uh, human activities are influencing the whole spectrum. Of species. <coughs> Maybe the most important factor is the intensification of agriculture, which is influencing and is connected with other human activities. I will highlight two species. Which, are, which were previously common in Central Europe. One is Senegal or Natu, the species which is not typical habitat generalist. And this species was uh, unfortunately preferring one specific habitat. It was smaller streams in lowlands. And these smaller streams, streams in lowlands were highly degraded through agriculture activities. And in the Czech Republic and in the surrounding states, for example, in Slovakia and Poland, uh, this species was extinct for maybe uh, 60 years. But after 60 years, it was found that this species is not extinct. But the species uh, was missing because people didn't thought that this species can survive in highly degraded habitats. And there was nobody who will found a species in this degraded habitat because there was no nobody who was looking at it. So uh, it was found that this species is able to survive there. There are small populations, and there is large uh, frequency of extinctions in this habitat. So this is a typical species, which is not typical generalist, but their habitat are so much degraded that this species is highly negatively influenced. Another example is uh, St. Petrum depressus for this species uh, is already extinct in uh, Czech Republic because 
this year we lost the last population of, of the species uh, we tried to uh, save the population with several purposes usually we try to persuade the fish farmers uh, to provide the protections for this locality uh, during the last five years the population of this species was about 30,000 of individuals but after five years we have only several individuals and probably these uh, individuals will not provide uh, offspring for the next generation so next year we're expecting that this species is extinct uh, the main problem of this species is that this species is not able to survive with, with fish and the habitats of this species are very usually habitats which were creating through floods and these floods are stopped during the uh, during the activities human activities which completely stop the uh, flooding the areas during the during the uh, spring and these habitats are completely missing and there were last several habitats which are recently <coughs> that but also this habitat habitats were changed through intensification of fish farming activities so we have lost also the species in Czech Republic uh, in Europe there are some activities which are trying to uh, save the diversity of ponds as, and ponds are seen as a very important habitat for the conservation so for example uh, this organization uh, can have provided a lot of information about how to conserve this uh, freshwater habitat and from the view of many ecologists uh, ponds, the problem of pond diversity can be seen as a complex problem in these pictures you can see uh, the natural pond in the, in, the, uh, in your right side and on the, the left side we have uh, changed habitat with some degradations so uh, this fish farming activities can highly influence this pond diversity not only by high fish stock because there are degradation in general in the occurrence of different species there are some degradation which are influencing the littoral vegetation and also big problems seems to be the absence of some buffer zone uh, which is uh, covering the pond against the influences of surroundings so if we look at the uh, threats on the pond ecosystems we have to study several different aspects there are, there is eutrophization of our high nutrition inflow in this habitat but there are also other activities which are uh, influencing by the fish farming activities but also activities which are not co uh, generally connected with uh, pond ecosystems so we have to look in the landscape and this is the problem of whole landscape not only about the uh, pond diversity uh, the problem is also that both of, of all of these effects can, are, can have cumulative effect uh, on uh, the ponds there is no one or several factors which influence the diversity but all these effects have cumulative effect and we are not able to separate each factor as one influence on this ecosystem so we have to study uh, the complex system with complex studies uh, so my uh, view of this problem or the solution of the problem can be seen uh, through the one of the uh, hypothesis or purpose how we can study this uh, systems many studies in the history in the previous years uh, try to understand the diversity as the, uh, as the result of some uh, some factors which are influencing the diversity so the resulting 
A community is something which is the result of several uh, environmental or biotic factors. But, uh, as I told you, the problem is that those <coughs> factors are influencing the community together. And we are not able to separate one or several of these factors. We have to study all these uh, factors in uh, one study or one uh, system, one design of study. So the filtering uh, metaphor, environmental filtering metaphor, how it is called this uh, pursuit of, of studying this, uh, uh, this uh, problem, is that we are trying to explain why we have so much or so low number of species in our pond, for example. Uh, we started usually with some regional species pool, and we are trying to understand why several species are missing. And there are several factors which are uh, probably influencing the resulting community. Uh, several are natural, and several are highly influenced by human activities. Well, dispersal limitation is the first step. Uh, usually the species which are unable to move in our community are missing. This, sometimes it is natural, but through the fragmentation and through human activities, it is much more complicated for the species to move to several locations. Environmental filtering is something which is influencing our species. Usually there are some limitations in, uh, in the specific conditions on the, on the pond. So we have specific conditions on the pond and there are several species which are not able to survive this. But we have to also include the biotic interactions inside the system because biotic interactions can also have negative or positive effect on our species community. So uh, these biotic interactions can be also influential to observe community. And the result of all these processes which are, uh, which are functionally connected, connected and they are uh, working together, the result of all these processes is observed community. So this is typical uh, filtering metaphor, how we can study the system. And usually, when we are trying to study the system through uh, species, it is highly unaffected because if we have, for example, thousands of species and we have to uh, provide all the information about for thousands of species, we are not affected. Uh, but there are some botanical, primary botanical, uh, methodological support for, for our studies. Uh, botanical studies found that there are some traits, some joint, uh, joint traits of species, which can be used instead of individual species. And this <coughs> trait can be functional, usually some uh, specific uh, adaptation of the species, uh, for example, dispersal ability, or the avoidance of fish predators, but also there can be some morphological defense and uh, also some behavior activity. All these traits can influence uh, how the species is uh, abundant in, the, in several ecosystems, and these traits can influence also uh, the response of the species to human activities. And this is my idea in the studies. I want to try, uh, I, I want to try found specific traits which can be uh, shared through all the freshwater groups of my study groups, for example, amphibians, diving beetles, dragonflies, and damselflies, and bugs. And I want to find these traits which can indicate uh, their success or unsuccess in uh, ponds, ecosystems. Especially if there is some fish farming activity, 
how this fresh farming activity is influencing different groups, according to traits, different groups of freshwater animals. Uh, I will go in, uh, into a different topic because uh, during my studies, I found that uh, freshwater invertebrates are usually somehow uh, somehow failing in habitat selection process. Especially in human-made habitats, ponds are also human-made habitats, uh, freshwater animals, but also birds, for example, are uh, during the habitat selection process, they are somehow failing. Usually because humans providing them some cues which are usually indicating the quality. And if these cues are somehow wrong, this decision is also wrong. For example, if we, if we mention insects or invertebrates, we have several groups which are not able to distinguish between freshwater habitats, water, and asphalt surface. So they can be somehow uh, misjudging the situation, and they are also can overposit <coughs> in the asphalt surface. It seems ridiculous, but it seems that this could be also much more complex problem. Usually, through the evolution, uh, freshwater animals uh, found specific indicators of water habitat. Because during the dispersal, if they move from one habitat to another, they try to find the other surface. And they have to uh, somehow be effective in finding this habitat, because in, especially in several landscapes, these uh, freshwater habitats are relatively rare. So they have to move uh, in the specific direction. And several groups of freshwater animals found that there is polarized light which can indicate water surface usually or more generally in history it was maybe about 99% that this polarized light indicate the freshwater habitat. If they found this freshwater habitat then they have another step they, in their decision they look at the uh, vegetation and if this vegetation is correct for their purposes, they decided that this is the typical habitat for overposition. But after the human activities, it was found that these proxy cues, as it is called, are changed because the humans created different structures which were not present in the relatively uh, not so, for the relatively several decades, they, they created asphalt surfaces, they created glass buildings, and all these structures were not present in the history. And from the evolutionary time, this habitat, uh, there is no possibility to adapt to these new structures. In this picture, we can see a dragonfly female, which is trying to overpose it on trousers. It seems also ridiculous. But it is connected with the polarized light detection. Uh, it was found that insects and many other groups of animals are able to detect uh, this specific polarized light. Humans are not able to do, to do so. So we were not able to uh, found this, the, this adaptation. But there are some cameras which are able to transport this uh, light into different spectra and we are able to detect it somehow. I'm not sure how it is working. But back to this problem of, of uh, water surfaces. Uh, there is one nice study from Switzerland where uh, the authors covered the small fish pond with plastic plate and they found that dragonfly species which were uh, ovipositing in this specific pond 
didn't change their behavior because they didn't mention the difference between the bond and the wood and the plastic plate. So they reposited also on this plastic plate. The, why they are doing so much, so such mistake? This is the specific camera which is able to visualize the polarized light. At the left side, we have water in some this is water, and in the right side, we have some plastics, materials, this one. And through the polarized light, there is no much difference between water and plastic. And also, the asphalt surface can be seen as some dangerous material, because there are this very close polarization of asphalt to freshwater habitat. And humans created much more structures which are closing into freshwater habitats. For example, these plastic materials uh, can also uh, indicate some freshwater. But these ecological traps are only a very small part of problems with uh, detection of uh, quality. These are these all groups. Uh, are failing in this habitat. But it was found that this problem is much more complex and many, many species of different groups of animals are failing uh, through the decision. These are mayflies which are uh, uh, overpositing on the glass surfaces. Uh, this frog is completely misjudged the situation. And this firefly is trying to overposit with glass. This bottle is more, it was found that if uh, scientists provide this males, uh, this bottle, and the female, they decided for this bottle. So it is very dangerous. So this is the study. And trying to copulate with bottles. This is the situation. The problem is, that they are not able to distinguish the quality. And why they are uh, doing such mistakes? Uh, usually, it was found that the, these mistakes are influenced by two different uh, problems which are both connected with human activities. One is uh, the change of <coughs> the cue set, because humans created the false cues, and this insect or this uh, freshwater animals are not able to use these cues or to differentiate these cues against the other. The other problem is that the resource quality usually is decreasing. So these animals have to uh, change their decision, but the quality is decreasing, so they have to to skip into the, the decision into the lower quality of resources and they also have misjudging the situation because there are different cues available. Both these problems can be very influential. Usually these effects were well studied on birds and it was found that there are four types of mechanisms which can be highly influencing the decision. Uh, we, I already mentioned several ecological traps. This is a typical habitat when uh, the, there is some cue which is not detected correctly. Uh, there are also source habitats. These are habitats with high quality. But we have also two categories. One are sinks, and these, the other are underwent resources. Sinks are very dangerous because uh, these are usually habitats which indicating uh, higher quality that of resources than they uh, already have. So they indicate quality, but the quality is much lower. Another group of potentially interesting habitats are <coughs> undervalued resources. These habitats have enough resources, but they indicate low quality, so they are not interesting for, for the, for example, for the female which is deciding for overposition and for the, this is 
for deciding the future of their offspring. So the problems are not only ecological traps, the main problem are also sinks. Freshwater habitats, for example, ponds, can be seen as a dangerous sinks. And we, in the conservation biology, we have to try to uh, find this type of habit if there is something like undervalued resources. And again, I will highlight the problem that both we have two uh, different effects which are highly influencing this decision. One is attraction, these cues are misleading the decision. And the second is degradation of habitat. So uh, usually, if there will be high quality habitats available, the attraction will, will be much lower. But if the degradation is degrading all the possible habitats, the attraction of possibly tribes is much higher because they have to change the decision in this in this habitat selection process. So it can be very dangerous problem. And already. Recently, we are not uh, prepared to answer this question because we are not ready to understand how much extensive is the problem for freshwater invertebrates, and we are not know how it is extensive for even, even all insects. But we know that they are mistaken because we are creating different traps which are usually commonly used for catching the insects. So the problem can be uh, very broad, but we need some information. We are only losing the species, but, but we don't provide any uh, solution. <coughs> In my studies, we try to understand the basics of the decision of freshwater insects. We try to understand the decision. So we have some arena where we have different predators or freshwater habitats without predators. And we try to uh, find if there is some uh, difference in the decisions of individual species. And we have to try to understand it, this general process in dragonflies, in bugs, in diving beetles, and also in amphibians. And we want to try to find if this decision is uh, the same for all these groups or it is somehow different. And in the future, we plan uh, to provide some different cues for this decision. So we will we, we'll try to make some attraction or something which will uh, deter uh, of any, this individuals deter from this habitat, but this habitat will have enough resources. And we try to understand more correctly. We also studied uh, the fish predators because uh, we want to know if the predators are not present, if there is any possibility to restore the quality of small parts of the habitat. So we provide some cages in the need of several regions in the Czech Republic. We install these cages on fish ponds with high intensity of fish farming activities. And we try to understand how uh, there will, will be the reaction of the community of different species. And we uh, already know that there is something in this, this um, result. But I have no, uh, no complete result, so I only have very small production. Maybe in the next years I will give you more. There are also studies which can be also uh, used for the situation in the Czech Republic, for example, and they highlighting the problems of buffers because uh, there are many, many ponds which are completely without buffer and the ponds are connected with the agricultural land, usually. And these connections don't provide any protection of ponds against, for example, uh, eutrophization from the uh, agricultural land, but there are also pesticide, some potential uh, negative effects without the buffers. 
And it was found in Great Britain that uh, the diversity and species richness in the uh, ponds with bunker <coughs> is usually much higher than in the ponds without buffers. So uh, maybe we can start with this not so controversial uh, conservation possibility, install the buffers on the ponds where they are missing. One problem of studying the diversity of ponds can be that we have only the ponds which are somehow influenced by human activities. Majority of ponds are uh, highly decorated or are highly intensively. Uh, there is high intensity of uh, fish farming activities, and it was also in the history in the recent decades. So we are not able to study the systems how they behave naturally. One possibility, in my view, uh, in, when I was in military training areas where these uh, ponds, which were also constructed with, with humans, they were uh, used for fish farming activities, but after they were abandoned and they were not intensively, uh, there were no intensification of fish farming activities. And these habitats, habitats are completely different in structure of vegetation, in the diversity, and also in the amount of nitrogen. Nitrogen usually. So we have to also study these uh, freshwater systems and we probably can understand several problems which can be somehow, uh, somehow important in the future. Uh, interestingly, when we study this uh, ponds diversity and we compare this diversity of uh, ponds in military training areas, we compare with conservation. Uh, protected area with conservation interest, we found that there is no difference in diversity and there is no difference in the uh, conservation value of this habitat. But these were common, uh, was common ponds of, which were randomly selected and the other groups were protected areas and their value was, was very similar. And what is interesting, we found that in these military training areas where the species, which are usually negatively influenced by fish farming <coughs> activities. So the species which are highly influenced by human activities were uh, common and abundant in these military training areas. And that's all. Thank you for attention. The increasing, uh, can you show me the picture with uh, the buffer zone? It's uh, simply ab only about the uh, additional habitat, the reeds, for example, around the fish pond, or the diversity is increasing also in the central part. So I mean, in the in the light, in the pond. That's they that's only one. measure the diversity inside the pond. Inside the pond. Yeah. Inside the pond. Okay. So it means that there are uh, other species which are not associated with the, with the buffer zone, or they are associated with it, and they they are not. Right. So this was only dragonflies, damselflies. They are positively uh, influenced by the presence of uh, the buffer, but they don't found any connections with the buffer. They have only found that there is no negative, if so much negative effects from the fields which are mm -hmm. surrounding. So this was some protection of the habitat. Okay against different negative effects from the fields. And th these ponds were very comparable in different other aspects. Uh, so maybe it's only mediated effect of, say, lower nitrogen contents because yeah. the buffer zone can influence yeah. the water quality, for example. And they also maybe provide some shelters more for, for, for yeah. example, yeah. when they are resting or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have a question, please. Uh, could you give me some uh, an example of uh, undervalued resources? Uh, 
or um, dragonflies, for example? There are some. There are not so many, and we don't know any any of them correctly. Uh, but for example, post mining in post mining areas, there can be some undervalued resources because these habitats at the beginning of succession usually seems that they are not interesting. There are not so many resources. They don't have uh, developed vegetation. And for dragonfly, it means that this is not so interesting. But maybe during the succession, uh, the little vegetation will improve, and this. Uh, these resources can be also attractive for them. But uh, this is very, uh, very complicated question because we have to understand they, how they are deciding for the quality. And the quality, measurement of quality from their view is different to ours. And it depends on how we can, uh, how we can provide them such cues this is for you, and this is this should be interesting for you. But I'm not sure whether it is possible for dragonflies. Maybe for birds, it, it is possible. For more intelligent, intelligent animals, it is much more well, possible than for insects. Thank you. Yes. You mentioned positive effect of uh, submarine vegetation on insects by this predation pressure from fishes. Hmm. Is there are any differences among uh, one species in this effect? For example, reed beds are better than sedge beds, or uh, submerged vegetation is better than reed beds, or so on. I know only uh, that the studies uh, which were connected with this topic study the structure of this the, these plants, and it depends how much protection and how much uh, uh, how much biomass this. Uh, plant is able to create some shelter again, for mm -hmm. example, for larvae against the predation. So if there are, for example, some nymphaluta or something which is, has only specific uh, uh, leaves on, on the water surface and there are no uh, such roots out, uh, in, the, in the bottom, so there is no protection for, for them. Yes, I understand that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Can you, can you specify a few traits which are say, inherent to both insects and birds? Because I have a problem to find some... some, some so I, I'm looking for this traits, I'm not <laughs> sure if they are in, in this time. I'm trying to find, because birds are, uh, in many aspects, are very different to freshwater uh, invertebrates. Probably this could be somehow, uh, it, uh, they could be also influenced by uh, I'm not sure whether the birds are influenced by the shading, for example. If there are there's something about the temperature of water, if they decided for the more cold waters, I'm not sure. It's, it depends. Mm -hmm. And do you have, uh, and they are included herbivorous insects, herbivorous insects in this uh, species? In my species, there are no herbivores. Uh, 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 I know. It is a pity because uh, <laughs> in many bird studies, uh, including uh, boreal bird studies, and uh, recently Central European bird studies, it's possible to show that uh, there are large differences if you look on insectivorous and herbivorous species. Herbivorous uh, grows much more better, and they are not affected by eutrophication negatively. Yeah, if you don't have herbivorous insects, it is very difficult. I have also small small group of herbivorous insects, but generally more of my study groups are predators. Yes. Yeah. Because they are much lighter <coughs> to study and catch them and so on. You have not so many, many possibilities. But maybe in the future I will, I will add more groups to my studies. For example, the cat. Flies are, kind of flies are seems to be a good indicator, but they are also predators for a species. So thank you for attention. Maybe we will see in the next uh, my next presentation in the future. Thank you.